I am joined today by my new friend, Mary Jo, who was a friend of Gary Pepper. She was part of the fan club. What is it called? The official Elvis Presley fan club of Great Britain. Okay. Where Gary wrote a, a, a monthly article. He wrote a, a, an article to outline what he had done around Elvis and what Elvis was doing uh, each month. So it was really a blog in those days. He was a blogger. It was on paper. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it looks like he ended the the Tankcaster from the Tankers fan club in 1963, and then he started writing for this British fan club newsletter. Is that right? Yes. It was actually a magazine. It was called Elvis Monthly, and it was a nice, glossy, little, small uh magazine that came out and it, it was very comprehensively done so it was actually a very professional you know uh thing that was sold in news agents and still is it was very exciting because each month you know you'd be kind of going okay is he home is he in los angeles is he is he riding his horses what's he doing you know what i mean so how did you meet gary um, I met Gary because originally I was only 15. This will take a little time. I'll try and make it as short as possible. Okay. When I was 15, I told my dad I wanted to go and live in Memphis. And so my dad answered me with, look, uh, you couldn't go and live in America before you're 21 unless you've been on a holiday. So I saved for two years. I actually left school at 15 and saved for two years. And while I was saving, I was looking around in the Elvis Monthly magazine to see for contacts for going to Memphis. So Gary uh, went to hospital at one point, and I took that opportunity to write him because he always put his address up on the, you know, mm. uh, 793 Eva Street or whatever it was. He, he used to put that up in the magazine. So I sent him a get well card and you know, told him that I planned to come and live in Memphis. <laughs> and so I would have been 16 at the time. And uh, the next thing, I actually got a letter back written in crayon. Gary used to write in, um, it was like a child's crayon because I suppose he could hold it better. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would, uh, it would be on a clipboard and he would be able to, write whatever he needed. So I got this letter written in crayon and uh, basically he was want to be my pen pal. Oh. So we, we wrote back and forth uh, for the rest of the time before I finished saving. Um, and he had arranged, well, his mother had said that I could come and stay with Gary wow. when I came to Memphis. So that was absolutely fantastic. I had a contact. Um, and I was delighted. Uh, so when I arrived in Memphis from the Greyhound bus, in those days it wasn't so easy um, no. and very expensive. So I flew into New York from London and went by Greyhound bus uh, 30 hours across to get to Memphis. At 17? So at the, sorry? At 17 at years seven, old? At 17, yeah. Wow. So uh, I ended up uh, arriving at the Greyhound bus depot, and you must remember there's no mobile phones, no cell phones, there's nothing. Uh, so all I had was the phone number, Gary. <laughs> uh, so I rang from the bus station, and Mrs. Pepper got on the phone, and she said, oh, and it was a bit like an Elvis movie, because um, a bit like Double Trouble, because she said, <laughs> mm. she said, uh, yeah, I know, we were going to put you up, but she said, uh, there's a girl arrived in from Australia as well. Uh -oh. And we didn't really think that the two of you would arrive. So we've actually asked Lynn to be put up in the YWCA. Uh, so we, if you wouldn't mind, we don't want to play favorites. So we would ask you to join her. You hadn't met her yeah. before, but you two were similar in age. No, I hadn't met her. No, she was 21. Um, so Lynn had brought a, uh, a lovely photograph album with photos of each fan done and a little bit about them written in gold leaf under the picture. And she had put this wonderful photograph album uh, together to give to Elvis. So she took uh, 
the bus from California to Memphis. You two were so determined me. to get yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. I was expecting a quiet night, and then Lynn gets a phone call. And it's from, I, I'm not sure if it was from Mrs. Pepper or from Graceland, quite honestly. Um, I, I, my memory tells me it was from Graceland, because I know I freaked out. And it was to say there was a movie on uh, at the Memphian. And would we like to go that night? Was that your first night there? That was three hours after I got there. That was worth the whole trip all the way to Memphis, oh, right? Yes. So Lynn asked me, am I too tired? I feel like I'm, <laughs> I think I'm okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I might manage. <laughs> we arrived at the Memphian and it was raining and it looked all closed up and... We were standing there just kind of wondering what to do quite and then the next thing Mrs. Pepper pulls up in her car with Gary. With Gary. And the next thing happens is that Mrs. Pepper gets out and she knocks on the window and everything lights up. Wow. And we're let in. Did you enter yeah. through the front entrance or was it a side the entrance? The front entrance. Mm -hmm. The front. Okay. And this um, was 1966, and, uh, right? This is 1966. Do you remember the movie? Yes, I don't remember the movie. No. I'm sure you weren't even no. watching the movie. Uh, it, it was probably after the Fox because Elvis played after the Fox many, many times. After the Fox okay. <laughs> during during our visit, but when Elvis was in the theater, you didn't tend to look at the movie. Right, I could imagine. The way the movie theater worked was that the locals were led into the the last couple of rows at the back and they were quite far away but us because we were visitors from out of town and Gary's guests mm -hmm. we were allowed closer so as you know Elvis and the entourage were somewhere in the middle of the theatre mm -hmm. um, and he wouldn't have arrived yet when you see we were seated first before oh. he would come in they had the two rows kind of in the middle and we would have been about three rows behind that. So you were waiting for him to arrive at this point? Yes, and we could hear like their conversations in those rows because they didn't, in a normal movie theater, everyone is quiet. Mm -hmm. But this was there, you right. could hear everything. So you were eavesdropping a little bit. Eavesdropping, <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, so wow. uh, Gary would sit now, this is uh, to my memory, but people always said no one sat in front of Elvis, and that's not strictly true to my memory. To my memory, Mrs. Pepper sat a couple of rows, it, it, or one row, I'm not sure, but there was a couple of rows or one row in front of Elvis's entourage, and she would sit in the aisle seat, and Gary would have his wheelchair then in the aisle. In the aisle, okay. That, that would make sense. So, the reason for that was so that Elvis would come in the left-hand entrance. The mm -hmm. left-hand, like it would say exit, but, you know, left-hand entrance. And he would walk up and he would get a chance to talk to Gary before he sat down. So that was the logic of that. Wow. So he wanted to greet Gary before he even watched the movie. He wanted to talk properly to Gary before he sat down. Because Gary couldn't talk properly. He couldn't talk to anybody but Elvis properly. And his mother. So it was easier to do it that way where Elvis could concentrate, Gary listen to his replies. So after a while, yeah. you could understand well, what think, he was saying. Yeah, yeah. And okay. of course, then Mrs. Pepper would want to have words as well. And oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so between it, he would have spent, like, he would have spent a good five minutes talking to Gary before he'd sit down. Wow. That is yeah. really cool that so, he, he included him in these things with his friends. All the time. I met Elvis twice properly. Well, once properly, that's a story. When I was sitting down waiting to meet him, if you were going to meet Elvis, you went and sat with Gary. Mm -hmm. uh, because that way, when he's talking to Mrs. Pepper and Gary, he's meeting you, you know? Yeah. I was warned by the guys that, by the guys, I mean people like Charlie Hodge and Richard Davis, uh, not to grab Elvis. That no matter what Elvis did, I was not to grab him 
pull them down towards me, try and kiss them, oh. or because I'd be seated when when I meet him, mm. he'd be standing. He came in that night uh, from that exit. As far as I remember, it was a brown shirt with a uh, a belt over it instead of you know how we normally wear belts. Mm-hmm. It's a belt over the shirt, oh. um, a studded belt. Uh, then he had a Frank Sinatra style uh, hat on. He came up, but he didn't talk to me. He was in a mood, as you know, Elvis got moods. Mm. He just gave a, a brief wave and moved on. But the second time I met him would have been much later, after the Mid-South Coliseum renaming of to the Elvis Presley Coliseum, briefly. Uh, and that time uh, was totally different. Okay. So do you want to talk about... So Gary was trying to get the Mid-South Coliseum renamed... Yes. And did he did he suggest that you and Lynn would be a part of this? Yes, uh, Mrs. Pepper mostly talked about it, and she would say Gary wants, you know, the way. So Mrs. Pepper told us that they were putting forward something to the Memphis City Council, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and that they were saying that the Mid South Coliseum should be renamed the Elvis Presley Coliseum because Elvis was a tourist attraction. Mm. Now, Memphis didn't feel Elvis was a tourist attraction at that time. Not yet. Because it, No, because it was before Vegas. It was before the comeback special. He would have made the movie Double Trouble. Roger Miller was singing England Swings, which Uncle Fester used to sing every time he saw me. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, well, England, England swings would have meant that it's in those days to be a swinger was not what you uh, would think today. It was actually meant that you were cool. Oh, okay. So it meant that that was the place to be. It was a cool place. <laughs> Memphis also, you know, they took him for granted. They did. Sure. There was nothing like, nothing like. Uh, the fuss that there is today. But Gary was very determined. So Mrs. Pepper told us that Gary would love it. Or, no, sorry, she didn't say Gary. She <laughs> said Elvis would love it. Okay. If, if we went uh, and confronted the council, um, and especially Lynn being a fan club leader, you could say, look, I have 400 fans in my club. And then me saying, well, I've come all the way from England. Basically, they could say, okay, we've won from England and we won from Australia, and these are tourists only here to see Elvis. That's a really good point, yeah. We thought Elvis would like it. Did you guys, did you have to practice what you were going to say? Because you had to sit in front of a commission, right? Lynn may have practiced. I'm not sure. I I think I felt a bit protected by Lynn Mm. because I was only. She was a little bit older. Yeah. And she is kind of a fan club leader of 21, you know. She's met Elvis several times. All I had to say, I knew quite a bit about Elvis. Um, and so I felt I could answer any question. And I could also represent the English fan club um, mm-hmm. quite accurately, like because I'd have read the Elvis monthlies. I traveled all that way. Uncle Vester used to think Lynn came from South America. Why is that? thought that she came from Argentina. Couldn't get it into his head, it was Australia. Oh my gosh, totally different. <laughs> yeah, totally different. Like, the other thing that Uncle Vester asked me was, did we have electricity in London yet? Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys still use outhouses and all that? Yeah. 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 So, we were talking a little bit earlier about how the mayor at the time, Mayor Bill Ingram... Um, yes. He, first he said yes to the project, and then he said no. But that all happened when we were there. Uh, at the okay. time, okay. Uh, yeah, as far as I knew, Mayor Ingram was always up for it. Okay. And wanted the Mid-South Coliseum changed, and therefore that's why he facilitated us so easily at the council. The way the council meeting worked was that you, you any member of the public could go and say they're... they're you know, mm-hmm. what they wanted the council to do. So when we went there, um, we waited until the, all the other business was done, and then Lynn walked up to the mic for the public. And she kind of put it forward uh, that we wanted this and that we were very much from out of town. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that 
we felt it would be a great tourist draw to Memphis. And then I got on the mic and I sort of reiterated that I was from England at the time. They let us sit down and they were humming and hawing. And then they, the mayor said they would have to deliberate over this and they call us, could we come back tomorrow morning? So we said, okay, but they had set up a press conference and this is where the TV came in, on the local news. Oh, you're on the news, okay. And they asked again, you know, where have you come from? <laughs> <laughs> and so did you Elvis know. catch the news? Is that how he saw yes. you? He was yes. watching the news and, and he saw is, you guys. Yes. This is where we this is where we heard that he wasn't too happy. What was his reaction? I think that he would have been very pleased if um, he had been given that honour, the Mid South Coliseum. Mm. Uh, to be renamed if it had been done just off the top of people's heads and they you know, said, look, this is what we're doing. Uh, but I don't think he was very happy with people campaigning for it. I think he, he didn't care mm. about recognition in that way. I think he would have been delighted openly to get it. But he was watching the news that he didn't like it, but... Uh, I certainly got that impression anyway. And you think that he named his horse Mayor Ingram kind of as a joke, poking fun at the mayor? Yes. Now, I'm, I'm only giving Mary Jo's opinion on that. I'm not... Like, right, it, right. I might, be totally, I might be totally off being with that. And maybe he did do it as an honour, but I just don't think you name a horse you Mayor Ingram. Uh, maybe, but you see, Mayor Ingram was always up for it, but the councillors weren't. Mm. And what happened was Mary Ingram read out this proclamation, renaming the Mid South Coliseum, which he did. Mm -hmm. So it was officially renamed, but then very shortly afterwards, the councillors overturned it. Did you meet him again after that properly? I did. Yeah, uh, that would have been after the Mid South Coliseum thing, mm -hmm. and, and this time he was totally different. Uh, came in that side exit. Uh, oh, by the way, when I met him the first time, when he went to sit down, Priscilla had actually stopped to talk to me. She squatted down by the seat and she found out where I was from and a whole lot of other stuff. She oh. was extremely nice. And do you know, I think it was the day that they got engaged. I think it was Christmas Eve. Really? You know, she could have been welcoming from I, again, I don't know if he got engaged to her before or after the movies. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. So it was right yes, around that and, time. and it would reflect on his mood. I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what, what was going <laughs> okay. on there. But um, basically, I'm just trying to stop my cat taking up the screen. Um, <laughs> basically, that was uh, the first time Priscilla had taken a lot of, you know, note of me and talked to me. Um, so the second time, I had some little gifts for him. I had a miniature book on uh, of, of a Shakespearean play because I knew Elvis liked miniatures. If I had, he liked miniatures. More, yeah, I heard that. Now, it's so again, funny. I love miniatures. I didn't uh, know that about you know, Elvis. Um, if I had known my stuff, I would have got him a miniature Bible. <laughs> and I did think about it, but uh, I, I'm not sure whether they were just hard to come by or whether I felt he had enough Bibles, you know. I got a lot of Bibles. Uh, so I got him one of those, and I got him a little thing. It was called, uh, uh, it was a little, it sounds awful when I say it today's language. It was like a troll. They were little things that were toys. They were... Kind with, of just with the hair faces with the hair but no they did they weren't like those little trolls they mm. were fully covered in hair oh okay and they had <laughs> little eyes and then they told a little sign and i don't know what my sign said i forget but they were from <laughs> london and they were very trendy oh that's cute uh, so i i had that for him. so when he came in this time he stopped and he said hi mary Jo." He remembered now, your name. I know the guys could have told him. Mm -hmm. um, so could Priscilla. Uh, he then took my hand and with his index finger, he rubbed the inside of my palm. Hmm. Okay. And I was 
delighted with this. Uh, and he had a nice conversation with me, but I can't remember too much of the gist of it because I was concentrating very hard on not wanting to pull him down and kiss him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just try and, if you try and look up and stare into his eyes while he's massaging your palm, <laughs> I'm afraid that my mind went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I think I understand. Uh, so then I did present him with the gifts and told him I was hoping to come back to Memphis to live and um, you know he went to sit down with Priscilla and I could hear it because Gary's only like one or two rows in front and he was saying look what that little girl from England gave me and mm-hmm. I think he might have been a little bit intellectually pleased because I gave him Shakespeare you know, I wonder if you those know, are in the archive somewhere because he kept everything. They did keep Lynn Lynn's photograph album. You've seen it on display. I haven't seen it on display when we went over to the Mid South Elegance Weekend uh, that Priscilla was hosting mm-hmm. so just in September. We were asking Graceland Archivists if they could find it. They could. They said they had it. Mm. But they couldn't locate it for us because, as you know, they don't keep everything on display. Sorry, excuse the cat's face. I just like how there's like just a cat head. <laughs> <laughs> Second meeting was absolutely amazing. Blew my mind. Mm. Uh, there was only one time I freaked out. We were yeah. Vester was on the gate. But in the guardhouse where Vester was, we were not only allowed into the guardhouse. Some days he would let us sit in the jeep beside the guardhouse. While he was, he was working, just, while while he was working, because he he knew we could we could see everyone who came in and out from there anyway. Okay. But he used to say, "Now I'm trusting you not to drive the jeep up the house. <laughs> Neither of us can Don't drive." drive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so we go and sit in there, and this day uh, we'd always ask Vester, uh, "Is Elvis in or out?" Because if Elvis was in. Obviously, you'd be watching every car that drove down the, the drive. Yeah. Otherwise, you and just don't was, have to worry yeah, about it. Yeah, and then you wouldn't be watching the car. The car, the gate open to let someone in. You wouldn't be paying too much attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but if he said he was out, obviously it was vice versa. You'd be looking to see who's coming in. Right. And that particular day, he told us uh, Elvis was in. So we were watching the house. You told me earlier how Vester would, when he wanted to take a break, you know, go inside the house for whatever, he would let you man the gate inside the yes, guard shack. And, yes, and that was not unusual. Like, it wasn't just us, mm. us international fans. It, he, would, he would do that with people he knew. Wow. <laughs> you know? So, so how uh, did you know who to let in? Uh, well, you, yeah, that's a good point, actually. <laughs> but... Um, I'm not quite sure how it worked. We would just open the gates. Just anybody. Let people in, yeah. I, I don't think the security, you, you know, if you think of the time it was, before the 68 special, before Vegas, mm. town fest. No fans working in the guard the shack. <laughs> but this day, we were sitting in the Jeep, and which told Elvis was in the house. And... Uh, we, we could see over the top of the guardhouse, the gates start to swing open, you know. Mm-hmm. So we just thought, somebody coming in. And we were just looking, vaguely interested, who is it? And the next thing, Elvis is full frontal waving at us. And in a looked like a black leather jacket. Only saw him for a fraction of a second, because we both screamed like Aegis and fell down on the seats, crying. And by the time we got up, he was gone. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Did he recognize you? Did he recognize us? I don't know, because that was a that was a, a brief wave. I think he would have waved to anyone who was in the Jeep. Okay. Obviously, Vester didn't just allow us in the Jeep. I think okay. that was a regular... So he's always See, he got fans. quite a few fans, um, Vester did, and he would... He would decide who he would let into the guardhouse. Obviously, you know the guardhouse is quite small. And this was the um, or, the other, not the original guard shack, but the one from the 60s that was white. This was the, 
Yeah, this was the one from the 60s, not mm. the concrete one you have now. Yeah. Um, so but it would was... fit probably five of us, maybe. Mm. So he would kind of go talk to the fans at the gate. And obviously they weren't allowed in. But there was a very, there seemed to be a very structured thing. Like fans wouldn't, if the gates open for car, they wouldn't run in. It, it wasn't anything like it is now. Were there always fans out front with you guys? No. <laughs> Gary wrote in Elvis Monthly, he would have outlined all of this. And I will send you actually uh, uh, a photo of the pages. He wrote about your visit, you and Lynn. Yes. And he talked about you in this magazine. Yes. Gary was, what did you say? Elvis, I don't know if Elvis approved everything he wrote mm. or how it worked. But, but he Gary was kind of the knew. liaison of sorts between the fans. Yes. Yeah. And Elvis would have been, you know, between Gary and his mother, they would have been very, very concerned with not letting say in Elvis anything Elvis didn't want them to say. Sure. So apart from the the faux pas of the Mid-South Coliseum, where they obviously were doing something that Elvis didn't particularly want, um, I think they were quite astute in not saying anything that Elvis didn't want leaked. Did you keep in touch with Gary after all this? I kept in touch with Gary, but unfortunately in 19... I got married in 1970. Uh, this is my second marriage now. But the first marriage I had in 1970, my husband was very uh, jealous of the Memphis contacts. He actually saw them as a real threat and he wanted me to stop writing to Gary. And so to save the marriage, I stopped writing to Gary and Lynn. I lost Gary. contact for mm. years. And by the time I tried to contact Gary again, um, but by that time, he was already passed on. Oh, wow. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, and I wouldn't, like, it's a big regret. How did you find out that I, he had already passed? Uh, I was trying to get in contact with him again, mm. and I was trying to get in contact through Patsy Anderson. I heard them that he'd gone. I, it was very sad. I, I suppose I always, I always thought the estate had taken care of Gary. I always thought that he was okay financially, that the wages would still be paid. And I didn't know about his dad's passing either. Oh, you so didn't? I okay. thought the, the dad would have been still working as a gate guard, you know. Yeah. So I, I, it is, it's one of the regrets of my life. Good. And the last time was a reunion with Lynn at the Mid-South Elegant weekend. Was that the first time you guys had seen each other since 1966? Yeah, for for first time in wow. what, is it forty three or fifty three years? I forget. Oh, wow, <laughs> I'm just curious about what you remember of Gary as a person. What was he like? Gary was, as I said, all there mentally. He was. I think he aspired to be. He would have loved to have been like Elvis. Mm -hmm. um, I think he admired an awful lot of the way Elvis was. Uh, I think Gary would have liked to be a womanizer if he could. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, one time Mrs. Pepper and Gary, um, myself and Lynn, for some reason we went to Graceland. We never got inside Graceland, Lynn and I, that's another story. But we were driven to Graceland by... Mrs. Pepper and Gary, they had to drop something off on the way where they were driving us. So they were let in through the gates. They drove up the drive. Um, the maid, Alberta V05, came to the back door. And uh, like we had driven around the, the, the left hand side, mm -hmm. Alberta V05 came to the door and she let out a, a yell at Mrs. Pepper uh, Oh, y'all come in, you know? And uh, Mrs. Pepper said, uh, we can't come in because Gary has dates in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think... had a sense of humor too. I think, yeah. I, and, and I also think Mrs. Pepper had a, a huge hope that one of the fans that Gary introduced to Elvis or who was hanging around 
would click with Gary and end up taking the role that his nurse actually took. Oh. So I think she was worried about, you know, what would happen to her, what would happen to Gary when she was gone. That's kind of what happened, in a way, just not... In a way it is, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But no, I do think Gary, if he was able-bodied, he would have liked the women just the same (laughs) as uh, Elvis and his crowd did. I had spent quite a bit of time with Charlie Hodge. Uh, uh, Richard Davis fancied Lynn and Charlie fancied me. So I spent quite a bit of time with him. Um, Oh, okay. uh, I uh, I got to know a little bit of the inside workings of how the guys work, shall we say. Uh, Although we never slept together and that was not of his doing. It was mine. I wasn't (laughs) about to do that. Uh, So what was Charlie like? Charlie was great fun. I yeah. had the opportunity of meeting Charlie again in Dublin years later. Well, a few years, few years before he died, I drove him. I actually drove him and his wife, Jennifer Hodge, mm. uh, because I was working with the Elvis Social Club. So I took Charlie and Jennifer out for the day to see a local castle. He remembered so you I from got before? Uh, No, he didn't. Uh, Charlie had a memory. He said, uh, if I slept with you and I don't remember, I'm sorry. And I said, it's okay, Charlie, because you didn't. (laughs) (laughs) You'd be so lucky. (laughs) In Memphis, as one of the guys, he was great fun. He was a clown. Mm. Um, He told me a lot about the Foggy River Boys uh, and his time there. And interestingly, in 1966, he was telling me that, um, oh, a lot of the guys are really hooked into Elvis and they've got no other life. But I have, I, you know, a member of gospel singers and I can go on tour. I can leave Elvis anytime I want. And he he ended up one of the guys that never did. Never. <laughs> the guys were a unit. Do you know that the, the mm-hmm. entourage were a unit? Did you meet any of the other guys? Yeah, Richard Davis. He drove us the first night. Um, mm. uh, in fact, <laughs> uh, remember, I've only been in Memphis three hours, and <laughs> we get to uh, the Memphian, and we go to the movie, and we can hear Elvis and all of this. And then uh, afterwards, Richard Davis, he'd been chatting Lynn up in the foyer, you know, and uh, he said, do we want to lift, instead of the Peppers giving us a lift back to the Y, do we want to lift from him? And we said, yeah, that's fine. And uh, we got in the car and uh, it was one of the made for Elvis cars, I think it's Lincoln Continental, it had made for Elvis Presley in a gold plaque on the dashboard. And it was one of those cars in the 1960s, it, it, you didn't have roll up windows and stuff, and he, it had electric oh. windows and stuff like that. Futuristic. And Richard drove us and he said, would you guys like to come to Graceland? And uh, yeah. I didn't have the knowledge that after the movies, that Graceland would be still alive like I thought they'd all be in bed (laughs) so I thought you'd go into a dark place you know I was quite happy to go to Graceland with Richard I didn't feel to be any problem Mm -hmm. because there's two of us I felt that he'd get in so much trouble if anything happened yeah because he's one of those trusted friends but Lynn Lynn was a little different and she said I think we'll have to ask Mrs Pepper if it's okay oh thinking there would be another offer well Richard just dropped us off at the Y in the rain we went into the bus depot and drank coffee till the morning instead of going inside Graceland I was asked again by Charlie but there were conditions and I wasn't prepared for that sure no. So, but I was asked, would I like to go horseback riding with Elvis? And, but you know. But I, I actually, on that subject, because a lot of people say he, that Priscilla got domino for that Christmas and that Rising Sun didn't come till later. That cannot be true because Rising Sun was there. There were horses there for the guys already. And we used to watch Elvis riding his horses on the hill. So their timeline is a little off. He brought the Circle G in February, but 
before he bought, brought the Circle G, he was riding horses, not just Priscilla and Domino. I left on January 10th and I saw them riding. And you saw that big yellow horse? Yes. Wow. You know, Elvis wasn't on Domino. Right. <laughs> When I send you Gary's article in the Elvis Monthly, talks about Elvis having a great time on horses. We met Jerry later as well. I got to know Jerry. He used to drive him to the gym back and forth. To the gym? Uh, yeah. He, the hotel he was in in Dublin was uh, didn't have a gym, so <laughs> Jerry has to work out. No, I never asked him, was he there when I was there? Yeah. I know George Klein was. Oh, you do you remember uh, him? I only remember him from the New Year's Eve party oh, because so he was the MC. Tell us about the New Year's Eve yeah. party. Oh, that was another so close, so far deal. Uh -oh. It was at the Manhattan Club, Elvis's uh, New Year's Eve party that year. We went to the Manhattan Club uh, for the party, and we were told that the girls at Gary's table got a kiss from Elvis. Mm. So we were sitting thrilled. with Gary. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we when we went there, uh, everybody started arriving. Uh, Vernon and Dee, uh, Minnie May, wow, all those. She came yeah, out for New Year's. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the, everybody started arriving, and and we were told Elvis was coming. All of that, and then it got past midnight. No Elvis. Past midnight. And. Uh, George Klein makes an announcement, you know, and he says, look, uh, he's trying to get in, uh, he's circling, you know, so we're still waiting, and then eventually he gets up and he makes an announcement, no, Elvis can't get in. The official reason was that he couldn't get a parking place, that somebody had leaked the information about the Manhattan Club, oh. that he was given the party, and people were coming to try and see him. Uh, but the unofficial reason was that he didn't like his haircut. No. <laughs> so, so we went on that evening. Uh, I danced a little bit with Charlie Hodge. She told me I danced like I'd lent my jeans, which didn't please me. Um, <laughs> however, uh, but other than that, it was a, a sad, like, you know, so close yet so far. Yeah. But Deal. you got to hang yeah. out with all of his friends who aren't even around anymore, so. Well, that's true, and uh, I've actually been extremely lucky. Very so Gary lucky. is uh, very, I mean, you were asking what he's like. To sum it up, uh, I think he was a very able-minded person. And mm. he made the very best of what he was given with a disability. I think he was also very innovative because to do the Tank Cruise magazine, now you might say, well, what else would he be doing with his day? So I think that was part of it, that he he couldn't work outside the home. So, you know, he was doing this stuff to pass the time as well. Uh, yeah, but, but if you think of well. everything that he accomplished, he couldn't walk, he couldn't really talk, but no, he did no. so much for Elvis and... You know, maybe a lot of people don't know about him, so I'm happy that you're yeah, able to he, share his story and your, your memories of him and what he was well, like as a, a real person. This has been awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure. He just happened to be trapped in this body and mm -hmm. uh, made the best of it. And he was very, very lucky to meet someone who took such an interest. I think it says an awful lot about Elvis. I think that the way he was with Gary was above and beyond what most people would bother with. And in that, he actually made Gary's life. He turned it from, I, I don't know if it would have been an endurance because he still had his mother and his mother did take care of Gary well. Uh, but I think it turned it from an endurance into a pleasure. That's, it, it gave him some purpose. It gave him a huge purpose. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing all of this about Gary and... My pleasure. Forgotten. Well, thank okay. you so much, Mary Jo. Thank you for talking to me.